All right, in previous videos, we've talked about hypothesis testing and how it ends up where we either reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative or we don't reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so how do we end up deciding whether or not to reject the null hypothesis? So we said we had some decision rule and that decision rule would say, okay, if blank, then we reject the null. If blank, do not reject the null. But we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about that decision rule there. Okay, so first, a couple definitions. We have test statistic. Okay, so we know a statistic is a number based on a sample, right? So a test statistic is a function of the sample, and because it's a test statistic, then we know that we're going to use that statistic to conduct our hypothesis test. So, for example, if we're working on uh, hypothesis testing for one population mean, then we might use a test statistic of our sample mean. Okay, so there's our test statistic. Then we use our test statistic to calculate what's called the p-value. So the p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that we observed based on our sample, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so in this p-value, it's all given that the null hypothesis is true. So we're assuming the null hypothesis is true, and then we're calculating the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that we observed based on our sample. Okay, so we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true in our um, p-value because in the hypothesis testing framework, we assume the null is true until we have evidence otherwise. All right, so there's our definition of p-value, but how do we actually use them? So p-values measure the evidence against the null hypothesis. So if we have a lot of evidence against the null hypothesis, that means that we're going to have a smaller p-value. Because if we think about it, our test statistic is going to be very extreme when we have a lot of evidence against the null hypothesis. So if we have a, maybe here's our sampling distribution for the test statistic. If we go further and further into this tail to calculate our p-value, the shaded area there is our p-value. As we go further and further into the tail, then we're going to be shading a smaller and smaller area, and so our p-value is going to be getting smaller and smaller as we get more and more evidence against the null hypothesis. So when we see a small p-value, then we know that we're going to want to reject the null hypothesis. So we calculate their p-value based on our test statistic, and then we will end up rejecting the null hypothesis if our p-value is small enough, so smaller than some predetermined threshold. So from applied stats classes, you probably know that um, that threshold is called their significance level, and so if our p-value is smaller than that predetermined significance level alpha, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so let's see an example of calculating this p-value. So in this example, we have a normal distribution, mean mu, variance sigma squared. Mu is unknown because we're doing hypothesis testing for a mean, and assume that sigma squared is known and it's equal to 100. All right, so our null hypothesis perhaps is mu equals 60, and the alternative is the composite hypothesis, mu is greater than 60. So remember, simple and composite hypothesis, a simple hypothesis is like our null hypothesis here, our parameter is just equal to a point, and then the composite hypothesis is saying something like mu is greater than 60. It's giving an interval for what mu is in. Okay, so we want to test these hypotheses, mu is equal to 60 versus the alternative mu is greater than 60. And so we go out and collect a sample of size 52, and we calculate the test statistic x bar, the sample mean, and it ends up being 62.75. All right, so with that information, we want to calculate our p-value. All right, so remember our p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that we observed from our sample, given that the null hypothesis is true. So when we're calculating our p-value here, we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So we're assuming that mu equals 60. And then we're saying, what is the probability of getting a test statistic x bar as extreme or more extreme than 62.75 given that mu is actually equal to 60? 
All right, so we have our normal distribution with mean 60 under the null, and then um, variance sigma squared equals 100. Under the null hypothesis, our, we have this normal distribution here with mean 60 and then sigma squared 100. Okay, so we go out, collect our sample of size 52, and we get a sample mean of 62.75. And then we're wondering, what's the probability of getting a test statistic X bar as extreme as 62.75 or more extreme? So extremeness would be moving further away from our null hypothesis value. So this shaded area here, that's our p-value. That's the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme as 62.75 or more extreme than 62.75, given that the null hypothesis is true. In other words, given that mu is actually equal to 60. All right, so that's our picture here. This is the area that we're looking for. So we can continue on to calculate that number here. Okay, so here's our setup, but we know that X bar has a sampling distribution under the null hypothesis that um, is a nor normal distribution with mean 60 and then variance 100 divided by 52. So remember, if our distribution for X had variance sigma squared, then we know that the um, variability for X bar is going to be sigma squared divided by our sample size. So sigma squared 100 and then sample size of 52. Okay, so we have our distri sampling distribution for X bar. We can go ahead and use that. So we're going to, for both these things, subtract off the mean, which is 60 under the null hypothesis, and then divide by the standard error, which is the square root of 100 over 52. All right, so if we do that, then that tells us that our p-value equals the probability that x bar minus 60 divided by 10 over root 52 is greater than or equal to our observed sample mean 62.75 minus 60 divided by 10 over the root of 52, given that in reality mu is equal to 60. So again, given that the null hypothesis mu equals 60 is true. Okay, so if we're working under the assumption that mu equals 60 is true, then we know that this is the same thing as a standard normal random variable. Okay, so if we denote our standard normal random variable by z, then this p-value is equal to the probability that a standard normal random variable is greater than or equal to this same quantity, 62.75 minus 60 over 10 divided by root 52. All right, so then we can go to our table or p norm and we can calculate our p value is 0 0.0237. So this shaded area here, which we said is our p value, is 0 0.0237. All right, so when we're calculating these hypotheses, it helps to go back to just the basic definitions. We need to know what is our test statistic that we're working with. Here in this example, our test statistic is our sample mean. And then we also need to know what is the sampling distribution of our sample mean. So here our sampling distribution was a normal distribution with mean 60 and then variance 100 over 52. So that's the sampling distribution of our sample mean under the null hypothesis. Because remember, we have to assume the null is true until we have evidence otherwise. All right, so we've got our sample mean, we've got our sampling distribution for the sample mean, and then we have our sample size and the test statistic that we've observed from that sample of size 52. So then we know that our p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one that we got from our particular sample, given that the null hypothesis is true. So then we can work with that, change that sentence into equations, and then eventually crank it down to a single number like 0 
So again, the smaller the p-value is, the more evidence we have against the null hypothesis. In other words, the smaller the p-value is, the more inclined we are to reject the null hypothesis. So if we saw a big p-value like 0.5, we would probably not reject the null hypothesis. And if we saw a small p-value like 0 0.0237 maybe, or like 0 0.000001, then we would want to reject the null hypothesis. And we'll end up uh, making that decision rule based on our predetermined significance level alpha. So if our p-value ends up being smaller than alpha, then we're going to end up rejecting the null. And if it's not, then we do not reject the null.